It's a, a privilege to be here tonight and get to talk about one of my favorite topics, which of course is bees. And uh, Harry knows that that I, I love to uh, uh, bend his ear, and, and when I get him in a car by himself, he doesn't have a chance to get away. And I can just talk bees for hours until we get to where we're going, and then uh, you know, then he says, Phew, "Man, finally!" You know. <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, the reason that I wanted to uh, talk about the, uh, the topic of sustainable beekeeping, and I'll give you a little bit of a, a kind of a background of why sustainable beekeeping is a, uh, a topic that needs to be discussed. Um, and that is because, as you all know, our bees are dying. <clears throat> In the last six years, in the United States alone, we've lost 10 and a half million hives of bees. That's uh, an economic loss of about $3 billion uh, in, in value. So, and we all are ex experienced at losing, losing bees. How many of you lost some bees this year? 50%. How many of you lost all of your bees this year? A lot of us have lost a lot of bees this year. This is really serious. And so we need to talk about how we can get our bees back and how we can make more bees. And that's how uh, we're going to recover is by making more bees. Uh, and so while tonight's talk is a lot about making nucleus colonies and, and splits, uh, it's, it's about a few other topics as well. And... Uh, I think that, uh, that, that you'll, you'll get an appreciation for how we're going to make more bees so that we can <clears throat> recover from this huge loss that we're all experiencing every year uh, for, for a lot of, uh, a lot of reasons. Now, but, but before I move into that, let me just ask, is there anybody here who kept bees uh, before 1990? Any, anybody? Okay, do you remember? The problem that you had, the biggest problem you had before 1990, it was too many bees. Right. What to do with all of those bees? Getting all swarmed. Right. It, was a, it was a major problem. Well, we don't have that problem anymore, do we, Fred? No. So uh, in 1926, Jay Smith, the great uh, author who wrote uh, Better Queens, uh, had a, a swarm that he wrote about. And the swarm came out of his colony and it weighed 27 pounds for a single swarm. Now, it, this doesn't happen anymore. But so beekeeping has changed and we have to change and we have to figure out how we're going to, uh, how we're going to overcome this major change. Next slide. Um, now, I've, I've got a, uh, uh, some yeah. handouts. Did, did, did it, if anybody wanted, uh, the handouts. I've got some 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 copies of this, and I'll just for you to make notes on if you wanted to. I'm going to talk about sustainable beekeeping and some ideas that I have about how you can make your apiary sustainable uh, by doing a few things. And I'm going to I'm going to do the the basic uh, tell you what I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you what I told you. This is what I'm going to tell you. Okay. We're going to keep at least three hives. We're going to make six nukes, and I'm going to tell you why. We're going to raise some queens. We're going to catch some swarms. We're going to plant bee-friendly trees, and we're going to do the three essentials. The three essentials. Treat for varroa mites, requeen every year, and feed your bees if required. And there's some, some points over here on the right that uh, go along with some of this. Next slide, please. So, first of all, the challenge of, of keeping one beehive. There are some major challenges with keeping one beehive. Basically, you can do it for a year, maybe two, but you cannot keep one beehive successfully for a long time because you're going to fail. And so there, there are a lot of reasons for that. And that is because your queen is eventually going to fail and you're going to have no backup plan. You're going to have no resources to move between colonies. 
and you're going to, to have no options. So the article that I wrote, it was published in our, in our newsletter uh, in uh, December of 2013 called Beekeeping 2.5. It's also on American Bee, in American Bee Journal. It explains why keeping two and a half hives or three hives is the answer, is the secret. That is the secret. You've got to do more than one, more than two. You've got to do three. And, um, and it explains exactly why. I'm going to talk about some of those points uh, in the, on the next slide, uh, please. So why would you want to keep more than one hive of bees? It's be, first of all, because when you look in a beehive, you do not really know what you're looking at if you only have one thing to look at. But if you have two and three, then you have comparisons. What you have is the ability to make hive-to-hive -hive comparisons. So you can actually uh, know a lot more about what you're looking at. And if, you, if, if the queen fails in one, you can move very young brood and larvae into the next one and let them create a new queen and make emergency manipulations. And then um, you've, got, you've got options. But if you only have one hive, you don't have any options except to go buy another package of bees uh, and, and install them. So the other advantages, of course, are raising locally adapted bees because our bees will adapt to local conditions. The nectar flow and the, and the pollen uh, sources and the, and the seasons, the climate in our area, the bees will adapt. So, but we have to give them a chance. And, and you can't do that if you keep buying bees all the time from uh, Georgia and uh, because they're, they're not, it's not the same climate down there. And then, then the other reason if we're keeping more hives of bees is because they're economies of scale. The more you have, the cheaper per hive overall. You know, it, it just, it, and you, when you buy three of something, it's, or go in with somebody else to buy six of something, uh, it's always cheaper and you can share the cost of shipping and transportation and uh, volume always gets you cheaper prices. So there's the economies of scale. But there are some disadvantages of keeping bees, and that includes the fact that there is more cost to keeping three or more hives of bees. It takes more time to manage them. How much time do you have? And um, it costs more to feed them. And those bees can drink a lot of sugar water. And sometimes, it, even though you've given them the best care and, and given them hundreds of dollars worth of, of sugar water, they still die. And so it's, it can happen. Next slide. So, there are three most important uh, tools in the beekeeping business. As a beekeeper, you know that the tools of the trade, the most important ones are the smoker, the veil, and the hive tool. But yes. what is number four? And the answer is the nuke box. Yes. And if you, <laughs> at the beginning right now, beginning the first week in April, when you go to the grocery store, when you go to church on Sunday, when you go to work, if there's not a nuke box with five frames of foundation uh, uh, in, inside it, in the back of your car, you're wrong. You, you, you got to go. You never go anywhere beginning now without a nuke box with foundation in it because what are you going to catch that swarm in? <laughs> what are you going to put it in? When you get to your bee yard and you find a swarm or you find uh, queen cells, what are you going to put them in to make a, nu a nucleus colony? It, it has to be a nuke box. So what is a nuke basically? Uh, 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 let me just define it real quickly. A nucleus colony is uh, a complete colony. It has It's a completely balanced colony. It has brood. It has foundation. It has... Uh, uh, drawn comb, it has honey, it has pollen, it's a perfect hive. It's just a small hive. And uh, we've been doing this, we've been making them uh, in, in some way or another for hundreds of years. They just weren't called nucleus colonies. Uh, the ancient Egyptians and, and uh, uh, other ancient cultures that were raising bees in, in those tubes, they were making nuke colonies. They just didn't call them that. Uh, and they, they had hundreds of them stacked up. Well, we've got, we maybe can't do hundreds, but we can do nuke boxes in the same, same sort of way. Um, there are a lot of different styles of nuke boxes, and you can use them in a lot of different ways. 
you can build up uh, with stacking the nuke boxes on top of one another. And uh, more and more companies now are building equipment that is uh, has two nukes in the bottom box. This is a, a divider in the middle of the bottom box so that you build two, two colonies in there. And then you start adding four frame supers on top. And so this is actually uh, eight frames, four and four, and with the uh, a couple of pieces of fairly wide board, a three quarter inch board as dividers in the middle, the uh, it actually is a perfect fit for four frames. Um, and so the advantages of this kind of a system is that for overwintering, the nucleus colonies warm each other. They provide each other heat. If you put four nucleus colonies together or four colonies of any kind and put them side by side and overwinter them, at the end of the winter, the clusters will be at a single location closest to one another. They know how to share heat. You know, it's like sharing body heat. You, you know, if, if it's really cold, that's what you have to do. And that's what the bees do. Uh, they share the heat. They know how to uh, take advantage of each other. And so the cluster will form in the center two clusters together and, and have some synergy. And uh, so there are lots of uh, ways that you can, can do that. And you don't have to buy the expensive equipment. You can build all of this yourself. And it doesn't have to be exactly like this. You can, you can uh, do some uh, makeshift arrangements with five frame uh, nukes and four frame nukes. Uh, I know people who, who uh, make uh, mating colonies using three frame and two frame nukes. Uh, there's a lot of different combinations that you can use and you don't have to, to go with the factory made really expensive stuff. Uh, next slide. Um, so here's a spot where on the left hand side where uh, a large colony, uh, a double or triple stacked colony, I uh, got into it last on the 7th of May last year and it was full of queen cells. So at that point, you don't have much choice. It's going to swarm. When you have soil, soil cells, you know swarms are within hours or days. You just, you're shortly going to see swarms. So when you have capped queen cells and there are swarm cells, you really only have one choice, and that's to make a nucleus colony. I only made nine from that colony. Wow. <laughs> only, only nine nukes. But I was ready. I had the drawn comb from the dead outs, from all the hives that died. I had the foundation. I had some spare honey. I was able to give every hive a, 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 a frame of honey, a little bit of pollen, at least one frame of brood, and bingo, there's nine nukes, and, they, and, the, and the queens went out and mated. I think almost all of those, at least eight out of nine uh, queens uh, got mated at that location. And uh, I... Uh, there are a lot of different ways to do that. One of the ways that you can do that, if you have a colony in a single location where you want uh, to, to, to split the entire colony and nuke the whole thing, is that if it's in an open place, you can take a, a platform and just put all the nukes in a circle so that the field bees will come back and say, oh, where do we have to go? And they split themselves up. If they don't split themselves up, then you can always move the positions around. And these, sometimes I would move, uh, uh, hives from the top to the bottom and get the field bees to split themselves up. Uh, another, of course, are other ways of uh, making nukes to include uh, the walkaway nuke where, where you walk away split, where you make it and then you take it immediately to another location so the field bees do not uh, have a chance to, to go back to the original spot. Uh, so if you make six nukes and you still lose 50% of your bees, how many nukes do you still have? <laughs> three. So guess what? That's where you have three queens for a really important purpose that I'm going to explain in just a second. Next slide. Hey, Joe, do you use uh, deeps on all your nukes, or does it matter? Uh, deeps are better, but I do I do medium nukes. I do deep nukes. I uh, People like mediums. Uh, you've got to you've got to stack them up higher to get the same amount of, of brood. That's a very good question, and uh, you can do both. And I make I make lots of both. Four frame or five frame? Yes. Four or five frame. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, you had the one on the back, last slide back. You had a double nuke 
It looked like to me on a transition piece on top of uh, a production. Yes, find that in Brushy Mountain. And uh, yeah. you, ever, you ever do that? I've never done it that way, but but that's a, a very popular way to do it. And you can you can overwinter uh, double nukes like that on top of production colonies where you have a irregular single colony and you're confident it's got plenty of stores for the winter. You can put two nukes on top of it so they, they get the heat from the from the colony below can help heat the smaller colonies above. There are a lot of different combinations. There's no limit to the to the combinations. And uh, I'm going to tell you about some of the, uh, the ways that you can do that. Um, but first of all, you, you want to have nukes because you want spare queens. How many of you have uh, a fuel gauge on your queen that tells how much sperm is left in her spermatothica? Oh, Pat does, yeah. <laughs> Why would you keep a spare, a spare tire in your car? But you might have a flat. Uh, is there any ch anybody here that has insurance on their automobile? Because you might have an accident. Of you know, you're, it's not a question of when your queen is going to run out of sperm. She's going to run out of sperm. You need to requeen. Where's your spare queen? Where's your insurance? She's in that nuke box. You just didn't think about it until now. Now you've got insurance, so you're good to go. You can drive confidently down the road knowing that you have insurance. <laughs> so she's not, uh, when you buy your queen or your package, she is not the 18-wheeler that has unlimited fuel and you never have to stop at the gas station. No. Everybody knows you have to refuel. So why do we think that our queen is going to last forever? You act like it by just thinking that your queen is going to stay there forever. Uh, where's Doug Schumann? He's the only guy who has who colonies who requeen themselves year after year after year. How many years, Doug? They died this winter. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> Even Doug Schumann has had a queen failure after seven years, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah seven years. Re so every fall or yes, yeah. uh, fall, spring, summer. Yes, <laughs> I'm going to explain. Explain the, the, some perfect ways to do it, but there's no wrong way to do this. Next slide, please. Joe, so, can't you make, they can only make once, or they can't, you can't keep producing? She can produce, but the, uh, she can produce uh, for a long time. <laughs> but if you're asking her to, to lay 2,000 eggs a day, you know, for her, for, for an entire season, she's going to probably run out of sperm. And uh, if she didn't get made, it, you know, uh, as well nowadays as, as maybe they did in the past, who knows the reason? So it's true that our Langstroth hives are too big to allow the queen to lay too many eggs. That's correct. Yes. At, and so mm -hmm. let me just talk about uh, let me just talk about where to put nukes. Uh, if you're going to overwinter nukes, uh, you, you know, don't think that you've only got one place to put your beehives. There's got to be multiple places to put your beehives, and that's one of the reasons why I recommend that you have multiple <coughs> bee yards so that you can move bees back and forth between locations. Here's a location where I overwinter nukes uh, in a, a little corner of my house, and guess where the snow, where does the snow melt first? Right there in that corner. Here's proof right here from just a, a month ago when there was snow here and it melted there, and if I'd had beehives in that spot again this year, they would well, they would have made it. Yeah, but so that same spot though is a burning hot spot for the summertime, and you can't possibly keep beehives in this location because it's the reflected energy of the sun will just burn them up. So you have to be able to move things around. And don't be afraid to move your bees, you know, to a shady place, to a place where they can get protection from the wind. From, to a place where they can get some radiation from the sun. In the 1700s, the, the uh, uh, people who traveled through Pennsylvania said they saw on the south side of every home in colonial Pennsylvania, the beehives on the south side of the house. Well, there's a reason for that. You know, they had, they had the skeps and they needed the heat from the, from the, reflected off the house and then they moved them. You know, they didn't stay there forever. They, they, were, they were movable skep beehives. Uh, next slide. Yeah, yeah. 
It's kept well, is a is the circular straw beehive that we kept that a lot of people used up until the invention of the of the movable frame uh, beehives the Langstrap height in 1859. So this is Brother Adam. Everybody knows Brother Adam. He was the famous inventor of the Buckfast bees at Buckfast Abbey in England. But that's probably all you know about Brother Adam, Buckfast Bees. What you don't know is that Brother Adam maintained since, after he took over the, the management of the apiaries in about 1915, he maintained 2,000 production colonies. But what you didn't know was that he maintained 2,000 nucleus colonies to raise the queens that he needed to requeen every spring. He requeened all of his production colonies in April, March and April, using the queens he took out of his nucleus colonies. Why didn't somebody tell us that? <laughs> Why has this been a secret? You know, it was Brother Adam's secret to success. It was not only good race of bees and, and finding good bees that were, were selected for their performance, but it was also his management technique that he was able to produce 158 <coughs> pounds per colony from a, 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 a huge number of beehives. It was a lot of work, but he had a system and he stuck with it. Next slide. So these two guys are my current heroes and have been for many years. Michael Bush, uh, uh, a great beekeeper from, from organic and, and, and uh, uh, natural beekeeping uh, guy who has an incredible website, uh, Bush Farms. Uh, in uh, Nebraska, and uh, Michael Palmer uh, from Vermont, who has figured out how to uh, make a lot of nukes and keep his product, his apiary going uh, uh, as well. Uh, and thanks very much to uh, uh, our Vice President, uh, Pam Crickley, for putting Michael Bush's uh, link to, to is right on our website. You can link directly to his website, and you can uh, and that's also the source where Pam was uh, able to obtain a copy of the book uh, Better Queens, which you can download directly from the Susquehanna Beekeepers website and uh, and read it. And and I know you don't have time, and everybody's has busy lives, but if you haven't read Better Queens three times, then <laughs> you need to do it. You know, it's, it's an incredible read, and you've got to read it multiple times. So, uh, Michael Bush uh, has uh, some ideas about nukes. He, he likes nukes. See that stack of nukes in the back? He puts a single light bulb under the whole thing and uh, puts just a tiny little bit of heat in Nebraska. So it's shared by 50 or, uh, 50 or 60 colonies, and he overwinters them. The perfect temperature for beehives to overwinter is 38 degrees Fahrenheit. That's where they use the minimum amount of honey. What was the average temperature in Bel Air uh, or in Street, Maryland this winter? About, yeah, about minus 20. I, it, just seemed, <laughs> it seemed really cold to me. It was not 38 degrees, I promise you. And so uh, if you can keep your bees in a place where, in a cellar <coughs> on the ground, directly in contact with the ground, uh, or some place where they're going to get something that's closer to 38 degrees, you will be better off. And uh, Mike Palmer does this by wrapping his bees and uh, in groups of four and putting nukes on top of them. Uh, lots of good techniques, and you can learn from their websites. They've got some great techniques that you can, can uh, learn from. Uh, if you ever get a chance to hear either one of them speak, uh, by all means, do not miss the opportunity. Drew. Is that styrofoam he has? Yes, that's pink styrofoam. That's the that's the just normal pink styrofoam. Next slide. So I love to build nukes and build them up. What nobody told you, or you're probably in your first B course because it was a little too much to comprehend. And I remember what it was like because there was so much information in that first B course that you just couldn't figure out what's important. What is, you know, there's so much information, I just can't absorb it all. It was so much for me that I took the first year B course two years in a row, just because I didn't think I got it the first time. And, and even after that, there was just so much information, I couldn't figure out what was important. Nobody told you that 
it's really important to help the bees build up because they like to build up. That is their, their first inclination. They really don't like to build sideways. You know, trees don't go sideways. Uh, they, trees go up. So if you can, you can replicate some of what the bees want to do, I think you will find that the bees will build up twice as fast than they will build sideways. I think you'll be really surprised. Give them a, give them a chance uh, to, to do that. Uh, one of the things I do is I, I feed uh, fondant uh, through the uh, uh, cover hole, and uh, uh, sometimes that works. Uh, fondant is really great. Fondant is one of the beekeepers also uh, great secrets, the secret tool bag. Uh, to get them through the winter is fondant. Uh, I highly recommend that. And there I've got some, some really expensive uh, feeders, as you can tell. Uh, those are uh, uh, little plastic feeders. I doubled up, put, doubled them up and put bricks on top. Sometimes the raccoons do uh, find those and, and pull them off. But, uh, but it's a, uh, it was just quick and easy and didn't cost anything. So it's just a bowl. It's a, it's a plastic bowl. Uh, what do you call the plastic uh, cups? Solo. solo cups. Yes, it's solo bowls. Uh, you know, dollar fifty for for ten. I just I stuff the fondant inside. We put the plastic on top of the fondant first. Put stuff the fondant inside the pla double plastic bowl. Put it inside. Put it directly over top of a hole, inner cover hole. Right. If you use an inner cover hole uh, and put a box on top of your inner cover. You can feed your bees through the inner cover hole. Just give, continue to give them plenty of ventilation because ventilation is very important. And, and as Dennis Herzog reminds us all, cold really doesn't kill bees. Wet kills bees. Yes. You've got yes. to stop. You've got to have ventilation to make sure your bees uh, do not get wet and, and, and freeze. Next slide, please. So... In Canada, two years ago, in Ontario, they lost 58% of their bees in the entire province of, of, of Ontario. Uh, the national average in Canada for that year was 25%. Does anybody know how many thousands of packages of bees get shipped to Canada from the United States every year? None! None. There's no bees allowed to go from the United States to Canada. The border is closed. Yes. So what do the Canadians have to do? They have to overwinter their bees. They have to make nucleus colonies in the springtime. They have to take all their colonies and, and take them down to five frame nukes and pack them tight and ship them as far south as they can to the U.S. border where they overwinter them on the U.S. border by the thousands. And then as soon as the spring hits, they take them back north, open up those, those five-frame nucleus colonies, put them back in their full-size uh, uh, boxes, and make tons of honey, uh, uh, more, than, more than we could ever dream of. They don't buy bees from us, and they make their own bees, and they do it in nuke boxes. So that sounds like an, an overwinter nuke. Is a full-fledged hive. They take it down to a five-frame size. Year. That's right. They take it down to a five-frame size and overwinter at that size, and then go back up in the springtime. Joe, uh, one thing about uh, in Canada, though, you have an entire summer of nectar flow, where in Maryland we have. Yeah, that's a huge difference. We have two weeks of nectar flow here. Yeah. We are we are very deficient. They have nectar flow all summer long. It's not fair. It's just, it's just not fair. But that's just the way it is. So, but we can learn from them. We can learn some tricks from them. Next slide. Yes. I have a question. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. I just can't figure it out. So, I have Illinois supers. They're mediums. Yes. Okay. So, and I keep three to overwinter. That means that you have three, and you leave. Actually, I left on four, which was my honey super, because I want to make sure that those right. bees had enough food yes. to make it. Yes. My bees did make it, but I don't. I just don't understand what it means to shrink your hive down to five to a nuclear size. How do they have enough food to make it? 
they, 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 they pump it in, they pump in the sugar water, the thick sugar water, our, our high fructose corn syrup, by, the, by several, a couple of gallons, directly into that box. They poke a hole in the side, and when they get to where they're going on the, on the border, they pump in a couple of gallons, and the bees drink it right off the bottom of the box. It's amazing, but that's how they are doing it. Uh, you, I'm not recommending that we shrink, necessarily that we shrink our hives down to five frames to try to winter them. The evidence is that larger hives are more likely to survive. So I'm not suggesting that. I'm just telling you what the Canadians have figured out how to do, uh, and it's just a little different way of thinking. What's the ventilation on that? Uh, I don't know exactly, but I think they punch a hole on either end, like an inch, inch hole on each end. Next slide. So what do you think you could do if you found some nice, big, fat, healthy swarm cells? Nukes. Make nukes, thank you. <laughs> Sybil Preston says, Joe, you would make nukes every day if you could, wouldn't you? <laughs> I said, yes, I'm afraid you're right. You know, it's, I, can't, I just can't stop myself. I, just, I, I love making, helping these bees make bees. And so if you found a bunch of queen cells that were especially swarm cells, those are your best, you could take this, and you could care. You could take one of the, this frame and, and make one nuke with a, a frame of pollen, a frame of honey, a frame of brood, and maybe a second frame of brood, maybe a second shake of bees without the queen in, in the same box. And then you could take this second uh, cell right here and very carefully with your pocket knife, which you always carry with you, just just carefully just cut it out cut it out very gently and then take it over to the next frame of brood that does not have a queen cell and press your thumb into the side to make a little indentation and then take that cell and press it into there at the top just enough to get it to stick and then that's your second nuke. Every queen cell becomes a nuke. You know, we have to, we have to take advantage of the bees. Do what they want to do. You can't always do what you want to do. You got to do what the bees want to do. And if the bees want to make bees, let's make bees. Joe, you made it sound like there's a difference between a queen cell and a swarm cell. Um, right. There are lots of kinds of queen cells. There's supersedure cells. There's emergency cells, and there's swarm cells. So there's three basic kinds of cells, and uh, you can look up the details in, in, in one of these books. They're a little different. The secret is where they're located. I'll just give you that as a hint. Okay? So check check that out. Next slide, please. Joe, do you hey, put Joe. two you put two in the box? No, I only put one in. But uh, if you want insurance, take two. Yeah, you're right. Two's two's always better than one. But one's probably enough. <laughs> in, in the new box, you put in the frame with the queen on it. What uh, what else do you put in the new box? Brood. Honey, pollen. Now, if you're making queens, you don't put the queen in with the queen cell, right? You know that, right? Because if you're, if you're making queens from queen cells, you've got to do that without the queen, okay? Everybody understands that. Do you move them? Do you move them from that yard or do you leave them there? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be smart, but sometimes you, you yeah, you can do it either way. You can do it, you can move them, or you can don't have to move them. Either way, it works. You can, uh, there's, uh, try both. And there's reasons for doing each one of those. Basically, it's about whether or not you want the flyers, the field bees. Do you have enough field bees? Do you need to make sure that the field bees stay with that nucleus colony? Nucleus colonies are, are sensitive. Nucleus colonies are delicate. They cannot maintain their temperature as well as a full-size colony. They cannot heat themselves or cool themselves if necessary, so they're more delicate. So you've got to be careful with them. You cannot put them in direct sunlight. They have to be in the shade. They have to be uh, enough bees to keep them warm. So it's a, little, it's a little more sensitive because this is a small colony. It doesn't have the capacity to do everything that a big colony can, maintaining its environment. So you've got to give them a little consideration. And if that means moving them, then we want to Joe, do that. Joe, that's why it's better, uh, what you've already said, a four or five frame nuke 
and you have pollen, honey, brood, and queen cells. Exactly. You gotta have all and maybe and maybe an extra shake of bees if you've got more yeah. bees. And if you can take it from multiple multiple hives, shake a bee is here, shake a bee is here, you know, from other hives, you're more likely to yeah, that's a technique. Sure. To, to get them from multiple locations. Yes, Doug. Just for the for the younger beekeepers or the newer beekeepers, can you describe why those queen swarm cells are there? Like leading up to this, because I'm not sure you covered what's occurring in a hive as to why these swarm cells are in the hive. You're right, and and I I apologize for that. Uh, there are conditions that exist uh, in the hive that uh, led up to the creation of those queen cells. The lack of pheromones from the queen, who is no longer producing the eggs that she should. She's running out of sperm, and the bees know it. But uh, I can't go into all those details in the very limited amount of time that Harry has given me. So uh, for the, those of you that uh, for that this is over your head. My apologies. Get on board. You know, get get on the train. All right. <laughs> Queen castles are uh, another technique. Uh, I I I think that Jeff Maynard has said that uh, the reason why we don't get a lot of mating success at four using four way queen castles is because the bees. Uh, think that they have a queen and they'll communicate across the, the divider board and kill the other queen cells before they hatch. So I don't recommend queen castles, but you want to try them? By all means. I've done it for years and I've failed uh, for years. And so, but please, by, by all means, give it a try. Everybody should try because we are bee farmers and farmers have to learn where failure is. Farming is about learning the boundaries of failure. So let's all learn. Let's let's figure out what succeeds. You won't know what succeeds until you know what fails. So let's give it a try. Next slide, please. So uh, nucleus colonies. Why would you want to build nucleus colonies? Because they're worth a lot of money. Look at this. You can you could have bought some from Better Bee if you had ordered before February for $175. You think your bees are not valuable? Your bees are very valuable. And if you can make some nukes, they're even more valuable. And that's a, uh, the, yeah, a nuke is a first year colony. Everybody knows that the second year colony is the one that makes all the honey. How do you get second year colonies? By making a bunch of first year nukes. So that's, that's how we're going to do it. We're going to make more honey by making more nukes. But it'll, it'll take the second year. Next slide. Oh, oh, now, yeah, it's a queen that's only going to be 10 months old. Brother, Brother Adam took his queens that he mated in June and July, and he put them in the production colonies in April. He took the production quality queens and put them back into the same nukes that he took the new queen out of in April. Okay, are you following me? Okay, he, he has he has nukes and he has production colonies. He, the nukes have the queens that he ma he made in June and July, so they're young. He takes them and puts them in the production colonies in April. Mm -hmm. Then he takes the old queen from that production colony and puts it back in the nuke for two or three months until he kills her. He squeezes her little head and he puts in a queen cell and they raise a new queen in the nucleus colony. Okay? Why didn't anybody tell us that before? Why, why didn't he put the old queen in there? So that the small colony would still be maintained as a queen right colony. Yeah. You cannot take the risk of not having a queen in there for two months. The colony will fail. So, yeah. so it was a pretty, pretty smart idea. But nobody has written about it except Brother Adam. And, and nobody has told me about it. And I'm really... Unhappy that nobody told me about that. <laughs> it took me nine years to figure that out. Next slide. Please. <laughs> so I, I, what, I was talking about nukes, and, and, and my advisors told me that I had to focus <laughs> on the subject. And the subject was sustainable apiaries through nucleus colonies. We couldn't really bear it, go off topic. But I'm sorry, I, I, I said, 
we really have to talk about some other little secrets before I let you go, and, and I have to, to get this out. And that is uh, some other things to do in uh, in threes. That would be plant three plants. And here are three that I really like and I'd like to, to recommend to you. Uh, Echium vulgari, borage, and anise hyssop. I hope I'm pronouncing them correctly. It, Master Gardener's in the room. Forgive me, please, for mispronouncing it. Joan, are you, are you there? Yeah, okay. I think you Borage is particularly interesting because uh, it's a weed uh, in some places, but uh, if you if you harvest it, harvest the flowers, they are the most delicious in a salad. It's like wow, this is really good. People people raise borage to put in their salads, in their garden salads. It's it, and it really I've tried it and it's really nice. Um, and the bees bees really like uh, all those as well. But you've got to plant a lot of, of anything that you plant. You can't just plant a little bit. You've got to plant a lot. So, you know, uh, find a place to plant a whole bunch of whatever it is that you plant. And then the other thing is that I'd like to tell you about is that you already been, you're already on board with already, uh, and I, I think most everybody is, and that's three trees that you need to plant for the long term. Because as the Greeks said, uh, <clears throat> Next slide. The Greeks said, uh, it's a wise society uh, whose members plant trees <coughs> under whose shade they will never sit, right. will never rest. Well, I tell you that it is a wise beekeeping <coughs> club that plants trees whose nectars will only be harvested by a future generation of beekeepers. We may never see all these things bloom, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't plant them now. Number one, number three on my top three list, golden rain tree. Uh, it, it blooms in uh, late June when, when everything else has stopped blooming. There's a, there's a lot of them in Bel Air. You can see them along uh, Churchville Road. Vitex negundo, uh, it's an incredible bush, sometimes called the chaste plant because the monks believe that if they made tea, from this, uh, they would have no uh, uh, desire for the opposite sex. Uh, so, uh, uh, but Vitex is an incredible, uh, it blooms all summer long. And it'll bloom like the first year that you plant it. It, it, it blooms, and you can trim it and make it into a tree, or you can let it go wild and it'll become a giant bush. It's a, a really neat one. And I have a bunch of extra ones, by the way, if, if anybody wants any uh, Vitex uh, uh, to, to plant. And then the, the last last one, the next slide, and my my number number one all time tree to plant is the BB tree um, because it blooms in July and early August when nothing else blooms, and when you see the bees and the other pollinators going for this for the nectar and the pollen off this wonderful plant, uh, you will you'll just be overjoyed with, uh, with uh, how much uh, the abundance is for them at a time when, in this area in particular, there's really nothing else for them. Uh, and yes, it is on the watch list of the Pennsylvania DNR uh, for possible jump into the wild. And I'm sorry, you know, I'm sorry about that. I'm still going to plant it. Uh, it's in it. That's just uh, a beekeeper speaking. Uh, next slide. So, uh, what I hope I've convinced you is that you need to keep three hives at least. That if you keep, if you make six nu nucleus colonies, that if you get half of them through the winter, you might have three spare queens the next year. It's a strategy. Uh, you can raise your own queens. When you find queen cells, and this is not rocket science. We can all do it. You know, it's it's just basic, basic beekeeping. Don't let somebody think that you have to to uh, buy queens. You don't make your own. Amen. Yeah. Um, swarms, 
all you know if the bees are going to swarm you got to take advantage of, of their natural tendency to swarm um, plant bee friendly trees and then do the three essentials you have to treat for mites because 70 percent of the backyard beekeepers do not treat for varroa mites well i'm sorry but that's why their bees die viruses kill bees you know that are transmitted by varroa mites you don't treat for varroa mites. You don't watch your varroa mites. Your neighbors are, you have low varroa mites and your neighbor uh, has high varroa mites. His colony dies. It dumps their varroa mites on your beehive. And you can have kill, killing your colony, you know, not instantly. As uh, Dennis Van Engelsdorp says, if your bees, if you sample your bees with an alcohol wash or a, a sugar roll and you have three mites per hundred, then you've got to treat and you might save them. If it's more than that, say five or six mites <coughs> per hundred, your colony is dead. They just haven't found out yet. So it's serious. Mites kill bees. That's, that, is our pro that is our problem. And requeen, we cannot continue to think that the queen is gonna just make it somehow on her own. We've got to, we've got to get smart and get those and get new queens in. Uh, and if you can, if you can do it in the springtime, if you can do it in the summer, you know, just just do it. Uh, uh, we, Annually, every year. Right? I would say yes, yep. every year. To think that you're going to get two years, and then you're going to say you're you're rolling the dice. Yeah, and that's right. Reverend Gordon, you know, you don't no, roll the right. dice. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we do not want to roll the dice. This is. Uh, and then, of course, we have to feed them if required. And uh, let me see if I've missed something else. I think, uh, think I've covered. So next. No, there is one point I noticed here. Overall, you stack the nukes four and six, you know, on top of each other over the winter. Do you recommend that for the brood chamber? You know, the overwinter main colonies too. Uh. I'm not sure I understand the question. For a, for a full-size colony? Yes. For a full-size colony? Stack the, you stack the nukes, six, eight, whatever, and you talked about the heat from one colony, another. If you can get them that big, yes. You know, I, I look at other people's beehives in other parts of the country and, uh, and other parts of, of uh, North America, and I see them stacked. In, in Michael Palmer's bees in, up in Vermont, you know, they're stacked uh, uh, six, eight, ten feet high. It's like wait a minute, what am I doing wrong? Well, I'm not doing anything wrong. You're not doing anything wrong. Bees just don't have enough nectar to collect to get them yeah. 10 feet high. That if better, they could, we would do that too. That better bee guy up there in, in Greenwich, New York, up in Europe where I'm from, he stacked them. I know that. Because he has the nectar flow. If we had the nectar flow, we could stack them higher and higher too. But I just don't think it's possible on a short nectar flow. Uh, I don't think he's. No, I'm talking saying about that. overwintering. Right. For overwintering. Um, the heat from one to the other, and oh, plus the wind. You know. That's a great idea. I, I would try it. Sure. Yeah, I would definitely try it. How do you treat the varroa mites? Um, varroa mites have to be have to be treated. Uh, there are natural ways. For example, by making nukes, you break the brood cycle. You break the brood cycle, and the varroa. Uh, don't get a chance to get ahead of you. Uh, that's that's one way. Then there's uh, natural treatments such as uh, thymol, uh, thymol gel, such as Apigard, Apigard uh, VAR. Uh, it's a soft <coughs> treatment. I recommend soft treatments. There are hard treatments, hard chemicals. Oh yeah. But I do. You know, those are not recommended. Uh, but, but they is will thymol, kill mites. Thymol a soft chemical. Or soft. Hard? Thymol is a soft chemical. Also, another soft chemical is formic acid in the form of mitoway quick strips, yeah, which uh, right. is formic acid. And this year, for the first year, we have U.S. approval for oxalic acid, and uh, I would try that. Uh, but you cannot ignore mites and expect that your bees are going to live. We have to take mites seriously, and we have to we have to take action. We have to monitor. We have to to measure the mite load, and we have to take action. Or we're going to continue to have massive losses of bees, and we don't have to. We don't have to do that. We can do something about that. Joe, I got a question. You talked about getting the bees over winter; it helps to keep them warm. But then you talked about 
making sure they're ventilated. Isn't that a mutually exclusive goal to keep them warm and to have the air circulate through there? No, it's not. And, it's, it, and, and that's a very good question. And I've contemplated that a lot. How do you, how do you, the main thing is uh, protection from the wind. Well, that contradicts pr protection from the wind. If you wrap them in black tar paper, for example, that kind of contradicts the idea that you've got to have ventilation. Yeah. Well, yes, you've got to have both. You've got to have protection from wind and you have to have ventilation. Think about it like your great grandmother's wood stove. It had a flue, it had a damper, it had something cooking in the middle that was really good, and there was moisture coming off of it. Well, it's the same with a beehive. You've got a flue, you've got a damper, you've got to have movement through that system all the time, but not too much. You can't have wind blowing through it, and I think that this is the challenge, is how do you get the right amount of ventilation without losing all the heat? It's, it's a delicate balance. Now, I think that's a really good question, Josh. It does seem contradictory, and uh, there are a lot of people who say you don't need to insulate. Well, okay, I, you know, I, I have trouble with it. You have to make your own decision. You have to make your, you know, a little bit of insulation. I think is is probably okay. Um, too much, and they're going to overheat, and too much moisture, and then the moisture is going to freeze, and you're still going to lose it. And are, you know, it's going to drip down on them. That's right. Sure. So it's a delicate balance. And, and uh, you lift the lid. I do. I keep. I keep. Long? I keep a little, a little crack in the lid. There. I put a, a spacer box on top of every inner cover, so that I have air space above the inner cover hole. Mm -hmm. When I open the inner, when I open the, the the lid, you know, I'm not directly on the bees. I'm looking in down in through the box through a box. At the inner cover hole, so I've got extra space to work to work in there, and I think the space. There have been some articles written about spacer boxes giving the, the bees space, uh, air space to to uh, control their environment a little more. These nukes that you overwinter, do you try to maintain those as nukes. The spring yeah. or go to full. As soon as, as soon as you get into the spring, you've got to take those nukes and give them into put them in full size equipment, or they're going to swarm. And that's contradictory. You know, full, you full size you, meaning two store. Yeah, you got to put them in ten frame equipment, eight frame equipment, mm -hmm. and then as soon as they're able, two two stories high, uh, you've got to go from small nukes to big colonies as, for your production, because that's where you're going to make the honey is in your production colonies. But those won't produce until year two. Uh, they're only actually one year old, but when you put them in a production mode, they become production colonies, and they're only a, a little more than a year old. Does that make sense? Right. You, took, you went new, you expanded to that takes one a year. box, two boxes. Yeah. Then, then, you, move them, then you move into big big size uh, boxes, and that's where you make your honey. It's the second year. In, in second year. Yeah. Okay. So, Joe, for those of us, I'm trying to think how I'm going to apply. When I go home, I have two healthy hives. Am I going to just keep looking for the swarm queen cell, or I, do I, I just gave them more room? One was busting at the seams, it, and I had one cup started. I broke it off. I probably shouldn't have given them the room and let the cup. I would have been able to have a queen to split. You, you have to, to give them room early, and if if if, if they've made a decision to swarm. Uh, you, the you either have oh, to make sorry. nukes, or you have to uh, take some other drastic action. Otherwise, are you going to, or you have to decide that you're going to collect swarms, and that's that's not a, that's not wrong buy, either. I should go buy a queen and try to make a nuke. Uh, you certainly could. That's another option, and that's a good option as well. Buy a queen, make a split now. It, it, it is an option. Yeah. So there's a lot of options. And uh, you've got to you've got to find the one that's right for you. That's pretty risky. You can do it. You, it. It can be done. And in fact, up until um, up until about a hundred years ago, uh, when the the big beekeepers would have a 100, 150 colonies in a in a bee yard before they kind of control swarming, and they would pay up. A, a, Ten-year-old boy, they would pay him just a little bit of money to sit in the bee yard and watch for swarms, so that they could collect each one as they came out. So during swarming season in the spring, on a nice sunny day, 
there would be a boy uh, uh, who his job was to watch for swarms. And when they came out, they collected them. If you show empty hive boxes, will they ever go there? Uh, no, they will only want to go, they'll prefer to go about 100, 100 uh, maybe 50 yards away to and hang on a, on a branch until they decide where to go to their final destination. And the Italians will go fairly close, the Carnies a little farther, the Russians a little farther, and for their preferred location, if they can find an optimum nesting site. And the hoist the box up in the tree. That, that's a great, there's some great articles about uh, swarm traps and where to put them and, and uh, how big they have to be. You have to, uh, that information is out there. I recommend that you, you, know, uh, uh, you try it. I've tried it. It, it works. It can, be, it can be done. It's a good way to collect bees. It's not easy, but it is a way to collect bees. Joe? One last question. Joe, the, the pet plants you mentioned, the Echium borage and hyssop, are any of them perennial? Uh, Joan, can you help me? The borage seasoned out. Um, it, it, it's an annual type of bee, but it, it usually will sell seed. The hyssop is a perennial. It'll come back. The first one I'm not familiar with. Ted, do you know that? Echium vulgari. Echium vulgari. That's viper's blue blossom. Yes, called viper's blue blossom. There you go. That's the answer. I didn't. Know. It's it's a biennial. Bi it's it's, bi it's, bi it's blue gloss. Viper's blue gloss is the common name. The uh, scientific name is Echium vulgari. Flowers in the second year. You got to keep every year. Drew and Jane have some if you'd like to see it out at their farm. Thank you. If anybody's got any pictures of these plants, by all means, uh, post them up. We have a Facebook site. And you can certainly load them up there. Uh, awesome. That would be a good place to maybe. What kind of area would you need to plant the hyssop to make it more feet high or feet high? I don't know. I just plant flowers feet. everywhere. Huh? <laughs> 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 Anybody else? That's right. <laughs> Well, I appreciate your time, and uh, I hope I haven't confused you uh, too much. Hope I've got you pumped up and ready to make some news. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.